morning. I want to welcome everyone this morning to the service to celebrate the life of Nancy A. McMullen. To those both present with us in person and to those joining us on our live stream on Zoom, we are thankful that you are able to be present for the service. To Nancy's friends and family who do not know me, I'm Pastor David Branicky, pastor of the Grace Baptist Church of Bluebell, where Nancy has been a member since 2004. She greatly valued the community of people at Grace Baptist, from young to old, the opportunities for service, and being a member of the Wednesday midday Bible study. We gather here today, families, family and friends of Nancy, to honor and celebrate her life. And at the same time, we gather to grieve with one another for our loss. It's appropriate for us to be here today because Nancy touched your lives and our lives in many different ways. And so today we share with one another both our sorrows for our loss and our gratitude for having walked a part of life's journey with Nancy, beloved mother, sister, grandmother, aunt, friend. On behalf of everyone here, I want to express our most sincere condolences to Nancy's family, to her sister, Gloria, and her children, uh, Robert and his wife, Georgiana, uh, to her daughter, Nancy Lynn and husband, Philip, and to Nancy's gr grandchildren, uh, Jennifer and Robert, Philip and Austin. The outline of our service can be found in the bulletin uh, which you received on your entrance. And before we begin with the call to worship, in invocation, I ask if you have one of these, that you make sure it is set to silent, as I just did my own. Listen to these words of our call to worship from Psalm 147. God is gracious. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let us pray together. O oh God, your care is that of a father who has compassion for his children, and as a mother who comforts her child. We cast our heavy burdens of grief on you, O oh Lord, deal graciously with us in our grief and anguish this morning. Grant us the comfort of your rest. Assure us with the confidence that your faithful servant has been received into the arms of your mercy and the blessed rest of your eternal care. And may our lives hereafter bear witness to the hope that is ours in the crucified and risen Christ, who defeated death for our sake and now reigns victorious in your glory. Through his name we pray. Amen. It's hard to shake off a mother's influence. John Newton's earliest memories were of his godly mother who, despite her fragile health, devoted herself to nurturing his soul. And at her knee, he memorized Bible passages and hymns. And though she died when he was about seven, he later recalled her tearful prayers for him. After her death, John alternated between boarding school and the high seas, beginning to sail with his father at the age of 11. Over time, uh, 
his life uh, took many different paths and many different uh, dangers and toils and snares, as he would say. At one point, he deserted the British Navy, was flogged, and he had a trial during that time. Eventually, he would have a conversion experience reading Thomas a. Kempis' Imitation of Christ. He would leave the life that he was living as a slave trader, and he would go on to work towards abolishing the slave trade in the British Empire. He became a clergyman and wrote many hymns, and of course the most famous perhaps is the one that we'll hear right now at this moment in time, Amazing Grace. If you're at home, we invite you to sing in your comfort of your own home. If you're here with us, uh, we invite you to stand as you are able, and please do not sing, but you can hum along the words as we gather together for this service. you to be seated. I want to invite, we're going to listen to some Old Testament words of comfort at this time. So I'd like to invite uh, Nancy's uh, grandson, Robert, to come forward and share the reading from the passage in Isaiah. And then following Robert will be her other grandson, another of her grandson, grandchildren, uh, grandson Philip, reading from Psalm 23. Good morning. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will not run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Good morning. A reading from Psalm 23. David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. 
He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to share a little bit of Nancy's life story with you this morning. Nancy A. McMullen was born on January 15, 1930 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at Germantown Hospital to her proud parents, Anthony and Linda D'Ambrosio. Nancy was also welcomed into the world by her older sisters, Ida and Gloria. The D'Ambrosio girls grew up in Philadelphia in the Mount Airy neighborhood. Nancy would graduate from Germantown High School in 1947. That summer, she and her mother were waitressing down the shore, and someone introduced Nancy to Mr. Uh, Bob Bauer. I pronounced his last name, your last name, right? <laughs> Before the summer was over, Bob would ask Nancy to marry him, but Nancy told him no, saying she wasn't going to marry anyone now that she was going to college at this point in time. So she enrolled at Westchester Teachers College, now Westchester University, and she graduated in January of 1951. Bob and Nancy dated throughout those four years. And so in addition to graduating from college, Nancy would also turn 21, and her and Bob were married in early 1951. She pursued her life's vocation, teaching. She taught elementary school for seven years, driving her Model A named Betsy from their home in Flower Town to a two-room schoolhouse in Bucks County. She would pause her teaching career in 1958 when she and Bob welcomed their son Robert into this world. In 1961, the Bauer family moved to Bluebell. And a year later, Nancy and Robert were blessed with their second child, a daughter, Nancy Lynn. Together, Nancy and Bob would raise their children in Bluebell. And she loved being a mother. Robert and Nancy shared with me how they remember her making the evening meals, always dancing and singing. And every holiday was celebrated from Easter to Christmas to birthdays. Robert and Nancy said they always had a feeling of safety in their young life because of their mother. Her advice was always sound and she was always delighted to see you. Nancy loved a good joke. When people asked her how old she was, she always told them that she was 19. And she and Bob liked to socialize with family as well as attending neighborhood dinners. And together they purchased a small house down at the shore and the family began enjoying their summers there. Nancy loved her family very much and Bob was the love of her life. Sadly, in August of 1971, he died unexpectedly. Nancy grieved his death while also continuing to live. She still had her two other loves in her life, her children, Robert and Nancy Lynn. She would return to the classroom teaching at both the elementary and secondary school levels. And she also received her master's degree from Beaver College. In all, she taught 37 years for the Plymouth White Marsh School District. And she was beloved by thousands of past students and coworkers. In 1981, she was a proud mother at her son's wedding to Georgiana. And then again in 1986, she was blessed with another wedding at her daughter, Nancy Lynn and Phil Maniscalco, as her daughter, Nancy Lynn and Phil, Philip Maniscalco united their lives. Having raised her family and seen them into adulthood, Nancy uh, remarried and married Robert McMullen in 1988. Together, they spent their later years of life, and one of Nancy's loves during this time was to travel. She enjoyed, enjoyed going on trips with elder hostels and visited places such as Ireland, Morocco, 
Alaska, Egypt, and Greece. She continued to enjoy going down to the shore to spend her summers, and she enjoyed spending time with her grandchildren. After retirement, Nancy volunteered at Chestnut Hill Hospital for 18 years, and she was a generous supporter and past board member of the Alumni Association of Westchester University. She enjoyed being with her many friends, including her friends from the neighborhood, her fellow teaching colleagues, and her faith community at the Grace Baptist Church of Bluebell. There, she was an active member of the Wednesday Bible Study Group and served in many different ministries, including the Interfaith Hospitality Team each March. Nancy lived a very full life, marked by love, gratitude. She was always sending thank you notes to others in a spirit of forgiveness. Having shared with you a little of Nancy's life story, I now want to invite Nancy's family members and friends to fill in any details that you have to share, perhaps a particular memory, uh, a, a word of thanksgiving for having walked a part of your life with Nancy. Going to invite her son Robert to share first, and then if anyone else would like to share, you can do so by coming forward and speaking from the lectern. Uh, when you speak, you can take your mask off. We would just ask that you put it back on after you finish. Well, good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Reverend Dave and um, our organist, uh, Barbara Ann Green, Mrs. Green, for their facilitation today for the, the service. I very much uh, appreciate your time. You know, I woke up this morning and um, a great many things surprised me. And there were some things that didn't surprise me. What didn't surprise me was the outpouring of love and respect by all of you by being here t today. Um, and I, that, again, is very much appreciated, does my heart good. What uh, did surprise me was how much this suit has shrunk up in my closet over the last year. Um, uh, on behalf of my uh, sister Nancy, uh, my mother's sister Gloria, and our families, thank you all for coming today. This past year has been a significant challenge and continues to be for all of us. Your presence here is testament to our mutual love and respect for our mother, Nancy. These reflections uh, are the hardest I've ever written and, and, and very inadequate in final expression and, re and reflection for this wonderful woman. It was difficult in the writing because there isn't enough time to properly eulogize my mother to the degree that she deserves and because while formulating the thoughts in my mind, I could clearly hear my mother saying, all right, Robert, get on with it, keep it short, let's get these people to the party and fed. <laughs> Unconditional love. Um, Nancy gave her love unconditionally. I wouldn't say that through this love and in her eyes one could do no wrong. Plenty of shortcomings and course corrections in my life, she uh, pointed out, but I can tell you every event, every behavior or action was a learning moment. Good or not so good. It was discussed for the betterment and education of her loved ones, and through these teaching moments, she had a gift of not treading on dignity but raised spirits, and she had an almost infinite capacity for forgiveness. She truly did have unconditional love for her family and friends. Uh, are people born that way? Maybe, to a degree. But I think it's a learned character element that was directly passed from her mother and sisters. That group of women I wish you all had known them as intimately as we did. That group of women were such a cut above uh, that their common, elevated, maternal character must have flowed and was confirmed one to another. Nancy loved our Lord God and his son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, beyond words. And through all her life, 
but for her children and her children's family and all those that she loved, she would have sacrificed the well-being of her own soul to protect, promote, and heal any of them. That's pretty heavy, almost blasphemous, but let me clarify. The way she loved and raised and provided for and facilitated was exactly in accordance with the teachings of our Lord. And through her actions of love, she was truly blessed and a place prepared for her forever. <clears throat> honor and duty. Nancy held these senses of honor and duty as foundations of her very life. Her essence, her sense of right and wrong were clearly a part of her very being. Helping and providing for others was always a driving principle for her actions. She loved her family, our God, our country, and she instilled these qualities and priorities in others. Not just by word, but by action, by faith, by love. When she found herself at the uh, crossroads in life of what decision to make, she lived by the credo that guided her actions. What would Jesus do before the phrase ever became common use and popular? She served her church aided hospital patients, and through her calling, expanded the young minds of students while instilling a moral code. Above all, she was a devoted mother. My mother was made a widow at 41 years of age. And like the pastor pointed out, we never missed a beat. Never missed a beat. Big hole in life because we lost my dad. But we never, our home was continuously filled with love, and fun and joy, every meal was prepared, every holiday was observed, and she saw that we wanted for nothing. When my father passed in 1971, we mourned, but we learned that through her example, that we all had to prevail for each other. And she was back at work that fall as a teacher to provide for her children. It was her honor and duty to do so. She once told me that doing the right thing to have honor is a gift a man gives himself. Honor can never be taken, only surrendered, and once surrendered, it's very difficult to retain. Sorry about the man thing nowadays, but she was talking to me. She was raising a young son to be a man, uh, but that philosophy is in equal parts applicable to anyone and is clearly instilled in my sister and her husband, who embodies it every day and has in the care and love that she gave my mother uh, and my aunt these many years. Thank you. So how do we resolve in our minds and spirit to carry on without her? Without her counsel, without her presence, without her guiding hand? How do I live up to those ideals? For me, and I'm sure my sister, those principles of unconditional love, of duty, of honor, of devotion are ingrained in our hearts to such a degree that, we will, that they will always serve as yardsticks of measurements of how we should live our lives. They will always be present in the foundation of our being and essence, and we, by God's grace in turn, have instilled in our children the very same. We're all proud legacy of those ideals. And by doing so, we have provided for a certain but very real level of immortality for her in this world. Now having reflected on all this, I was still trying to come to terms with why my mother was taken from us, why she was called home. And the only way I can conceptualize the process of sainthood and, by my thinking, all good people who have been called home to God can be thought of as saints, was by putting it in Navy terms. You'll have to bear with me on this. You of other walks of life, upstanding people, um, can put it into terms, but for me, I'll put it in Navy terms. 
I'd like to think of her departure as the end of an extended deployment overseas. I'll give you a little flavor. In the beginning, the ship gets underway. You bid farewell to your family and true loves and execute your devotion to mission day in and day out for what seems to be a never-ending length of time. You're gone. They're on the pier. You've left your loved ones. Sure, there's love and duty and fraternity. The love comes from, the, from your personal contribution, um, uh, but for what seems like that endless day, your real loves, the ones that you are wrapped like a warm blanket, remain at home. Finally, after you've earned the right by your sweat and sacrifice, you and the ship find yourselves on the way home. And the weeks it takes to make that trip home seem longer than all the months that have gone before. The day arrives, the ship transits the channel, and in sight of the pier, you see what and who awaits. The lines are made up, the engines are secure, and the brow is lowered to a flood of unconditional love that finally awaits you. You're home. You're happy. The love you carried with you now is confirmed, validated, and is embracing. In that moment, it is ecstasy on earth. In God's kingdom, Nancy has come home from deployment. Awaiting her is God's love and that of her husband and her mother and her sister and her family and friends that have come home before her. And she is home and she's happy. And God's love that she carried with her all her life is confirmed and validated and all embracing like that warm blanket. Except this ecstasy is forever. And so my dear friends, until that time comes for all of us, we remain on deployment to this earth until we've earned the right to be called home. And when that happens, mother will be waiting on the pier for us to wrap us again in that warm blanket of love forever. God's blessing on you all. Thank you for celebrating my, our mother's life and for us in the rejoicing in clear knowledge that she's home. Thank you, Bob, for those words uh, for your mother. Reflection, eulogy. Spoke to many of us here. If there's anyone that wants to share a few words, uh, memories, Thanksgiving, you're welcome to do so. morning. Um, I'm Irene Phillips, member of um, the church. Usually sit right there and Nancy and her friend Linda Lynn would sit right behind us and every Sunday she was always smiling, happy, joking with us and it was just a pleasure to know her in that instance. I didn't, you know, know her beyond that. Um, she also invited my mother to lunch, took her out to her nice lunch, um, and tried to engage with my mother as well. So it was just, she was a blessing to come on Sundays and see her in that pew. So we will miss her.
Let us move forward with our service at this time. We're going to have some New Testament words of assurance that are going to be read by Nancy's granddaughter, Annie. Good morning. I first just want to say that I'm so lucky to have known Nan for nine good years and I'm honored to be joining her family. So first a reading from the Gospel of John chapter 14 verses 1 through 6 and verse 27. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. And now a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter five, verses one through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thank you, Annie. The title of my meditation this morning is A Faithful Woman, A Faithful Woman. And the scripture for my meditation is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. And there we read this sometimes puzzling story uh, of an interaction between Jesus and a woman from Syria, Phoenicia. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence a secret. In fact, as, she, in fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia, and she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Let us pray. Creator and always caring God, at your word and by your will do we begin our lives. And in your love and knowledge we end our days on this earth. Blessed is the day when our spirits return to you. 
May your spirit be upon us now as we remember the life of Nancy who lived as your servant and who died in your friendship. Help us to remember with joy and thanksgiving and help us to comfort and to share. Help us to let go and accept the healing that Jesus taught us to trust and expect. In him we pray. Amen. The choice of scripture for my meditation this morning might seem unusual. Might seem unusual for a number of reasons, uh, because at first glance, Jesus is not portrayed in a very flattering light in this scripture. But I chose it because the woman in the scripture is remarkable for several reasons. First, she is a foreigner. And if she has any religious practices, they are not the same as Jesus's. She comes from a different culture, but she comes to Jesus, and she comes to Jesus at a time when Jesus wants to be left alone. He wants to not be bothered. He has gone to this vicinity to avoid the crowds. He enters the house and wants to be left alone, but she comes to him, and she comes to him out of concern for her child. Now, Jesus, in this conversation, makes a point of letting her know that his first obligation is to come to the people of Israel, and that leaves her out. But she insists. In fact, she's a bit bold with Jesus. But that comes after she's made it clear to him that her child is in danger. And so whatever Jesus felt about the wisdom of helping a foreign woman, he was clearly drawn to children and clearly wanted to express love towards them. Like Jesus, Nancy McMullen loved children. Not only her own children, not only her own grandchildren, Not only their friends or their spouses, but all the children she taught for those 37 years. An elementary teacher is a very special person in a child's life. How many of us can still name our teachers from our grade school years? Mrs. Marcelli, Mrs. Danner, Mrs. Ashbrook, Ms. Plunkett, Mrs. Pappas who more than once took this young man aside to teach him a few lessons that he needed to learn. Certainly many adults remember Mrs. Bauer today and how she was an amazing teacher who taught them, who loved them, and made them feel safe and secure. We can give thanks to God for Nancy who shared with Jesus that gift of loving children. Surely she loved not only her own children, but all the children she taught. Nancy also enjoyed cooking and welcoming people into her home. It was said that she had the gift of hospitality. Plenty of time was spent with family and friends around those dinner tables. And there she would share such wisdom as her son shared. And something they shared with me is that she often would say, it's not that God doesn't hear you, just sometimes the answer is no. Nancy was a giver. She knew it was more blessed to give than to receive. She took care of the people around her, both at the dinner table and at those tables we call desks in school. And it was there that she taught people how to live. Taught people how, young people, how to live their lives, as Bob said, with honor and duty. And so what led me to the story from the New Testament is that it depends on table manners and table habits. And when Jesus said something about how table habits ought to be, the woman in the story seems seems to know more than he does. She says to him, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that that fall from the children's tables. And what she said made so much sense to Jesus that he heals her child. He grants her request. He crosses all cultural boundaries. All the religious practices, the different religious practices don't matter anymore. 
Jesus crosses those boundaries and extends the gift of grace and the gift of healing towards this woman. We celebrate the many hours and years that Nancy gave to making tables, whether a dinner table or a student's desk, pleasant, healthy, beautiful, healing places. And that is to recognize in her something of the same gift that Jesus noted in the woman seeking help for her child. They both knew about these places where people connect and they respected those places. And when Jesus granted that woman's request for her child, surely when she returned home, she was filled with gratitude and wonder and thankfulness. And so likewise, I thought of this passage because Nancy was a woman of gratitude. In her life, she knew grief, losing the love of her life at the age of 41, after 20 years of marriage. But because she grieved well, because she knew blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, she also lived well, living her life with a grateful heart, lifting up her life and her works to God as a daily offering. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12, in view of God's mercy, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Nancy offered her life up to God. Nancy offered her life up to God in pursuit of her vocation and service to God and neighbor. And her life was a fragrant offering, not only to God, but to all of you who are here with us today, here in person and gathered with us on Zoom. Nancy made life more pleasant, more blessed, more full for countless people and for countless people who never knew her name. And as we gather here today, we grieve this loss in our lives, but we also celebrate Nancy's life. For many gifts came to you through her. So we can give thanks to God for her life, for the way God's Spirit lived and moved through her as she gave, as she taught, as she forgave, and as she thanked, as she lived a life of gratitude doing it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayer of thanks for your servant and our friend, for her love of children, her own as well as those not her own, for the way she brought children into the life of faith, for the way she taught them and showed them that they were loved. For her steadfastness, her faithfulness in the way she lived her life. We give you thanks for the faith she carried in her heart and expressed through her work. In these days ahead, O oh God, we pray that you would walk with us. Be strength for us when weakness is our portion. Be light when the darkness comes early. Be wisdom when doubt fills our thoughts. Be hope when loneliness is our companion. Lord, we pray especially for her family, for her children, Bob and Nancy, for their spouses, Georgiana and Phil for her grandchildren, for her sister, and for her church family and her friends. Lord, may they know your healing this day. Be for us healing as you were to others long ago and promise to be for all your servants. As we close this service, O oh God, we joyfully affirm our faith in your raising Jesus from the dead and in your power to make all things new, to be renewed. In the name of the Lord of life, we pray. Amen. There's a wonderful hymn that the family requested to be sung or to be
played at the end of the service. And again, we invite those on Zoom to sing in the comfort of your own home. And those gathered here, we invite you to hum along to the tune. But the wonderful hymn is, Let There Be Peace on Earth. And the words of that hymn say, Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Many people want peace in the world. They want peace in communities. They want peace in their own families. And of course, that peace always begins with the peace of our own human heart that we would be a person of peace. And we find that peace when we find that our soul rests in thee. Augustine said, you know, O Lord, our souls are restless. May they find until we find our rest in thee. So I invite you to stand at this time and to listen to the music as it's played and to hum the words to this wonderful hymn, Let There Be Peace on Earth. I invite you to receive this benediction, this final blessing. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ, Himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Amen. Amen.